So um, I thought first I might um, just talk about who I am a little bit, because uh, this is the first time I've spoken here. Um, and, uh, and then give you two important updates in surgery. So um, as a surgical oncologist, oftentimes um, I would be the first person you might see as a patient, uh, mostly because I'd be providing the initial surgical care and opinion regarding the biopsy you've had done, what treatments might be uh, worthwhile, um, and then as Dr. McWhorter had mentioned, referral on to a medical oncologist if that was appropriate. Um, so we'll talk about two um, important things that have been happening in the surgical oncology world in Melanie. Melanoma, one being a landmark trial that came out um, just in the last short while called the MSLT2 trial, um, and that's regarding how we manage lymph node basins in patients that have had sentinel lymph node biopsies. And then the second is um, treatment options for patients that have in-transit melanoma. And so I'll define that for you and discuss that a little bit further, but two important updates. So, um, so to start off with, um, who, who am I? Um, so I, uh, I did train here, as mentioned. I trained in medicine and in general surgery here. Um, I went down to Roswell Park in Buffalo um, to train in surgical oncology, which included um, surgery of all the body systems, so GI, uh, skin, breast, and so forth, but uh, was really... Um, really interested in melanoma and cutaneous um, cancers right away. Um, so my two-year fellowship focused on, um, on all of those different sites, but ultimately I was actually recruited there um, and worked there for five years in the Department of Melanoma and Sarcoma Surgery. So I was one of three surgeons there doing um, melanoma surgery. Um, and then I uh, was was recruited back here, which is where I actually sort of always wanted to be um, as I trained here to join um, some of the other surgical oncologists um, and the uh, very diverse research community that's here. So um, I've been back since February of 2018. Um, and uh, my, my main surgical practice, as mentioned, is, uh, is down at Hamilton General. Um, and of all the uh, things that I'm the most proud of here, I think the thing that I'm the most proud of is being the fellowship program director um, um, and so um, I'm very committed to, to educate, education, as we had just talked about, educating um, trainees who are coming through, whether they're family medicine trainees, internal medicine trainees, surgical trainees, about the importance of skin uh, evaluation, about the importance of taking a good biopsy to determine what a patient needs, um, and then also the appropriate survivorship and follow, uh, follow up for patients. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, as we said, we recently moved back. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, uh, just starting grade one in junior kindergarten. Um, so I'm a busy uh, mom otherwise, but uh, otherwise um, a research interest I think that I didn't mention is a lot in the patient education uh, realm as well. Um, very interested in making sure that when you see me um, and we discuss surgery, I want to make sure that you understand what is available, what is appropriate for your care, and that you um, understand why we're doing all the steps that we're doing. So um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So um, historically, um, when you might see a surgeon as a new melanoma patient, um, you might be offered what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is a, a biopsy that uses um, a tracer and a dye to be able to identify the first draining lymph nodes to a particular skin lesion. So for example, if the melanoma that had been identified was on your arm, you had an injection of a tracer, it would identify a lymph node or lymph nodes within the armpit or the axilla, and we could remove those lymph nodes and determine has there been any spread or not. And that's appropriate for certain patients with melanoma, um, not all, so some of the thinner or less aggressive melanomas we don't offer that for. But if that was done, um, historically, if the lymph nodes were positive, so they contained melanoma, we had um, a concern that there would be additional positive lymph nodes in that basin. So if you had two sentinel nodes removed from from the axilla, one was positive, we have concern about 20% of the time there'd be additional um, lymph nodes in that same basin, so we would offer surgical management by removing all the rest of the lymph nodes in that basin. You can imagine that's a morbid surgery for anyone who's had a completion lymph node dissection. Um, it involves you know, a more extensive surgery, it usually lasts several hours. Um, and there was really no great way to say um, which patient might actually have the additional positive nodes. So uh, CT scans could be helpful to determine distant metastatic disease like 
lung, lung nodules, liver nodules, as discussed earlier, but lymph nodes can still be involved with melanoma, but be, appear completely normal, normal appearance on a CT scan, so they can be normal sized and so forth. Um, so most patients were offered this elective immediate larger surgery to remove all the lymph nodes in their positive lymph node basin. But what we could predict as surgeons, um, and the more experienced you are, the more um, able you, are, you were to predict um, the chance that that patient might have additional positive nodes. So what you were finding would be um, a patient that was low risk for some reason, lower risk, like either their initial melanoma was a bit thinner, the amount of positive uh, or of cells of melanoma cells within their positive lymph node was you know, smaller or there were less numbers or the metastasis was smaller, um, would have no additional positive lymph nodes in that basin. And so in that way, you gained information, but the patient had a larger surgery for which they had to recover um, and could cause potentially some uh, long-term side effects, lymphedema and so forth. So as surgeons, we wanted to have a better way to be able to know was that step necessary and could we in a way select um, patients that could benefit from the bigger procedure who were more likely to have positive nodes and were there any alternatives for watching patients. So the uh, MSLT1 trial was, just to give you history because there's an MSLT1 and an MSLT2, the MSLT1 trial was the one that just showed uh, the value of doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy for early stage melanoma patients. The MSLT2 trial that I'm um, speaking about is the one um, that evaluated um, two groups of patients. So it was all patients that had had a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy at their initial melanoma surgery. Those patients were randomized into either the control group where they had the standard therapy, which was the immediate dissection, the removal of all of the lymph nodes in that lymph node basin, versus a group that was watched very closely. And with watching, it's not just physical examination, but it was also the use of nodal ultrasound. So nodal ultrasound um, includes evaluating the lymph node basin alone, not all lymph node basins, just the one where the sentinel node was removed from, and evaluating several very important factors, not just you know any ab abnormal looking lymph node, but um, hypervascularity, nodularity within the center of the lymph node, um, particular size and dimension uh, factors, and these are all delineated within the trial. Um, and so patients were randomized to either one of those groups and then followed along for um, overall survival from their melanoma, and then also the likelihood of having recurrence in the nodal basin as found on nodal ultrasound. So the real question was, can we spare a group of patients the bigger surgery? So this was the trial, which was published just um, in 2017, so about a year, year almost and a half ago. And it has probably been the biggest change to surgical oncology and melanoma in the last short while. Um, and it was almost immediately um, effective um, in changing our practices. Um, and I'll show you some of the results here. So this doesn't project all that well, but basically, um, overall, um, about 900 patients, 800 to 900 patients in each group, so a fairly large trial. Um, and uh, the majority of patients had kind of um, intermediate range melanomas, so 1.5 to 3.5 millimeter depth or so um, within those groups. Um, and then everything else was equal in terms of gender and age and, and uh, so forth. Um, so in the nodal observation arm, they had regular follow-up visits and had ultrasounds at each one of those visits. So it was not just a once a year type of thing, it was actually a very intensive follow-up strategy. But an ultrasound is a very um, simple procedure to have done, it doesn't cause any discomfort, it doesn't have any side effects like um, radiation from CT scans and so forth. Um, and so this was done at the regular visits in general every four months or so for patients um, over the five-year time period. And these are the important radiologic features to look at. So again, it wasn't just, are there any enlarged lymph nodes, but all these very specific radiologic things that um, a radiologist would be looking at on the ultrasound. And so um, in terms of the overall survival, so there are two arms, the group that had the immediate dissection, which is in blue, and then what was called the observation arm, which was the group that was spared the bigger surgery and just followed with ultrasound. And you can see here in terms of the survival, um, so this is melanoma specific survival, there is absolutely no difference. So there's no difference in survival. So doing a larger surgery to remove additional lymph nodes was not uh, efficacious in, in changing the survival of mel for not melanoma melanoma patients in this trial. What it did show, though, is um, in terms of, um, so it's the, 
sec uh, the second bar on the right, um, there was a division there in terms of being able to, um, in having a recurrence. So obviously there was a small group, and I think it's about 20% that actually did have a nodal recurrence. Those patients were identified on ultrasound and then subsequently went on to have a surgery for their lymph node basin. So the surgery that they sort of um, were proving themselves to need at some point in time, but they, the other 80% of the group that didn't need the nodal dissection because they were followed with ultrasound with normal ultrasounds over the study period didn't ultimately have to go through that surgery. So it shows us that we can select the group of patients that ultimately will show us that they need an operation versus the group that um, could go along all the way without needing to have this larger surgery. So it's showing us that we can be a little bit less aggressive and be able to use some different tools like ultrasound to be able to evaluate these patients carefully and follow them along and then act on important um, changes to an ultrasound or important changes to their report. Um, so for the nodal surveillance group, um, there was an abnormal ultrasound or an abnormal physical examination in about 23% of patients at three years and 26% of patients at five years. Um, and so in that group of patients, those were the ones that needed either a biopsy, like a needle biopsy at some point in time, or needed the bigger surgery, which you can imagine um, for that group, there was something that they were um, acting on based on a, a biopsy or an ultrasound report, but that spared the other 80, 70 to 80% of patients a bigger surgery. Um, and then in terms of thinking about side effects, um, as uh, patients in the room who may have had the bigger surgery, the lymph node dissection may know, um, the most concerning side effect is that of lymphedema, which is swelling of the extremity that um, we've removed lymph nodes from. So if we're talking about an axillary dissection, having swelling of the arm and hand on that side. Um, and so, um, for the group that had the immediate dissection, um, the um, lymphedema rate was about 20, so it's one in four patients, which is a fairly high rate. And if you're thinking about an individual who's very active um, and uh, having to deal with lymphedema, it's a very difficult side effect to manage. And it's something that oftentimes requires management on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, and oftentimes it is something that's permanent and lifelong. Um, and so that's very different from the group that was just monitored by ultrasound. So clearly if we can just um, select the patients that need to have the surgery versus doing the surgery on every patient, we can save patients some of these side effects from, uh, from the larger surgery. So second part um, I wanted to discuss um, was uh, treatment options for in-transit melanoma. So mel in-transit melanoma is considered um, melanoma that spread outside of the primary site. And it looks very different than a primary melanoma. So Dr. McWhorter had shown you, um, you know, atypical moles. This is a situation where there has been an atypical, you know, a, a melanoma, a diagnosis of a melanoma, but these um, in-transit lesions are evidence of spread of the melanoma cells into the dermal lymphatic. So the little lymph chains that go from the primary site towards the lymph node basin. So for example, I'm showing you in B and D here, someone's leg. So generally the melanoma that it started at is further down on the leg towards the foot. And then these little nodules happen somewhere between where the melanoma had started and the lymph node basin, which would generally be the groin on that same side. And you can see sometimes they look very different. So uh, the person at the top has these sort of fleshy looking in transit lesions. They look sort of nodular. Um, down below here, they're more pigmented and more raised. And then this person on the other uh, sort of right panel doesn't even really have any skin component. It's just a nodule under the skin. So very different than um, th all of the manifestations can be very different. So they really just need to be evaluated. If there's something that is changing, it's something that just needs to be evaluated by someone who knows what they're looking at. And then ultimately, potentially a biopsy. It is considered a form of stage three melanoma, just the same as lymph node um, involvement is stage three. Um, involvement of dermal lymphatics is also stage three and can happen for patients that have lymph node metastases or distant metastatic disease, like to the rest of the body, or can happen just in isolation. So there are patients that I've treated throughout my uh, years who have just popped up with in-transit disease over and over again and just has a, um, uh, some difficulty in treating it because um, you can see it can be rather limited, like the one person with the one nodule versus a more extensive amount on the leg. Um, so when we think about 
treatment, um, because it's such a variable um, presentation, um, there, there may actually be many ways to treat this and, and many ways that work very well. It really depends on if the patient has melanoma elsewhere. So for example, if there's been spread to other organs in the body, this might be better treated by Dr. McWhorter and colleagues with some of the systemic therapy so that the whole body can be treated at one point in time. However, if it occurs in isolation, so for example, just a few nodules on the leg, that might be more appropriately treated um, by a surgeon with surgical excision uh, or other treatments. So it really depends. But the real important part about treating in transit disease is it's really great to be treated as part of a multidisciplinary group where you have both a surgeon, a medical oncologist, potentially a radiation oncologist, um, discussing the care of the patient and determining what would be best. Um, in general, um, as I mentioned, patients that have systemic disease, like in the rest of the body, are better treated by a medical oncologist. Um, the, the treatments for in-transit disease include, um, just as that person had had one nodule just on the face there, if it's just one single nodule, oftentimes we'll just remove the nodule just under local anesthetic um, or, uh, or general if necessary. But um, having just you know one or two small lesions that can be removed, generally surgery is recommended for that. Um, if the area is uh, not amenable to having it, having the lesion removed, sometimes radiation treatment is appropriate, or if uh, potentially a patient is too ill, um, you know, even um, based on any medical problems or what have you, to have an anesthetic, potentially radiation is used. There are also, for some of the lesions that look a little bit more superficial, some of, some of the topical treatments, which are like ointments or chemotherapy drugs that can be applied directly to the lesions, like each spot. Um, and then the treatment that I wanted to discuss a little bit more um, is the intralesional or injected treatments that go directly into each of the spots. And the few that are um, more frequently used would be IL-2 or interleukin-2, uh, BCG, and then um, TVEC, which is a modified herpes virus, which currently is used in the United States, not yet in Canada. Um, and so all of these medications, in particular IL-2, which I'll talk about more on the next slide, um, IL-2 is actually uh, an immune type medication um, and it, it had been used in the distant past and still is used in some hospitals as an IV treatment, but it does give a significant um, number and severity of side effects uh, that actually require hospital admission. So we've used IL-2 now in lower doses injected into each of the, the uh, in-transit sites to both limit the toxicity and limit the amount the patient's absorbing into their body, but also getting the good effect of it um, being able to kill the melanoma. So um, so this is the, the drug. It's, it's named Aldous Lucan, which is IL-2, and that's just in the right corner. Um, and it uses the, your, the patient's own immune system uh, to recognize a mountain immune response. So very similar to some of the medications that Dr. McWhorter discussed earlier. Um, and as I had said, when it's given IV, very severe side effects, usually ICU admission, lots of fluid shifting, needing IV, IV fluids and so forth. Um, but we found that injecting very low doses of IL-2 directly into the in-transit lesions um, lead to more minimal side effects. The side effects that patients will get, and, and this is usually 5 ml injection, so very, very small volume, are mild, um, and they're very usually limited to about 24 hours from the time of the injection. And they're usually more like um, flu-like symptoms, muscle aches, uh, bone aches, maybe some nausea. I had one patient um, that had some mild uh, loose stools, but usually, again, everything is limited to 24 hours and then um, usually resolved after that. We do injection treatments for the melanoma spots every two weeks. Some patients, um, in particular the younger ones, can tolerate treatment every week, and so we can actually shorten the treatment interval. So I've had some patients on one week, every one week treatment. Um, the one thing about this treatment is there is no randomized control trial to prove its effectiveness. We have many series of patients in the published literature showing very good responses. Um, this one in particular from 2010 showed a complete response, meaning the lesions completely regressed in about two-thirds of patients with a very durable response. Um, but there's no randomized control trial with curves of patients showing survival or a, a difference there, mostly because um, I think there are probably lots of options for patients with in transit disease, and it's very difficult to randomize patients in an appropriate way. Um, but, uh, but I'm happy to announce that um, we do now have an IL-2 program here in Hamilton. 
Hamilton, who just started in June. I put a happy face there because um, we have lots of patients that are currently getting treatment and uh, they've had excellent response. Um, and uh, we are now one of three programs in all of Ontario, uh, London, Toronto, and, and us for the time being. Um, and uh, the the it's, it's just been um, a bit of setup. So we just started in June, just getting pharmacy on board and um, the clinics and how we set things up. But right now it's a very smoothly running program with a lot of patients really benefiting from it. So, um, so I think I'll probably stop there and um, ask if anyone has any questions for me. So I, I've certainly heard um, about about it. Um, I think um, I think I'd like to know more. We hadn't been using it at Roswell Park when I was there, um, but I do know that um, I was actually working with a plastic surgeon yesterday who had trained in MD Anderson, and he's now recruited back here, and he's interested in getting that started. So I'm really interested to work with him. He had done a lot of lymph node transplant surgeries down there at MD Anderson. Um, I think um, I think it's it, it will really be important to study it well if we're going to be doing it um, in terms of kind of baseline lymphedema and all of his other um, indicators beforehand but I'm, I'm excited. I think it would be very reasonable, especially for the patients that unfortunately have to have that surgery for one reason or another, um, to know that there might be some alternatives for sure. 